chapter 6. And I saw that the lamb had one of the sinews, and I heard one of the four animals saying, like with the voice of thunder, come. Come towards the mysteries instead of fleeing from them like most men. And you will see. Come towards the mysteries. The vision is being given to John and he's being invited to pay attention and to heed what he will see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat upon it had a bow and there was given to him a crown and he went out conquering in order to conquer. That's strange. Well, it's a lot. The white horse, Irenaeus says it's Christ. The horse is, the white horse is Christ. But others say it's the first preachers of the gospel. And Christ will be the horseman a little further down. So it's better to think, say, the first preachers of the gospel. The apostles, if you like. The white horse is more or less the apostles. Who flung themselves like noble war horses into the battles of God. The apostles seem like a noble horse flinging himself into the battles of God. The horse is a noble animal. Apparently it liked war. It wasn't too difficult to get a horse to go and gallop into war. Uh, white, the purity of early Christian morals. A white horse because of the purity of early Christian morals. If Christ is not the horse, then Christ guiding the apostles is the horseman. The horse of the apostles, Christ is the horseman, guide, the horseman on the white horse, guiding the apostles. And he that sat upon the, upon the horse had a bow. The bow is scripture. A weapon like two, two-edged sword, scripture, two-edged sword, scripture here, a bow. And there was given him a crown. The crown is the right to rule over the whole world. Christ the King. The right of sovereignty over the whole world. And he went forth. Exhibit. He went forth. He went forth from out of Jewry. Judaism. He went forth from out of Judaism. Within the Apostles, that's of course the Council of Jerusalem, 45. Great question, you may remember in St. Paul. The great question of Christianity breaking out of Judaism. The butterfly breaking out of the chrysalis. He went forth out of Jewry, conquering in order to conquer. Conquering the world, the flesh and the devil, in order to conquer souls for heaven. So that's the portrait of the early church. The devil reacts, and that's immediately the next, the next seal. Second, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. And there went forth another red horse. And he that sat upon him, it was given him to take peace away from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The red horse is the bloody persecutions of the church. That's the second age of the church, the age of martyrs. So far it corresponds to the seven ages of the church. The age of the apostles, the age of the martyrs. The bloody persecutions, starting from Nero and finishing with Domitian. The ten persecutions. The horseman here is the devil. The horseman on the red horse is the devil. Receiving permission to take peace away. Receiving permission to slaughter, if you like, in order to show forth the, vic the virtue of the Christians. The, those 
obviously those martyrs are a glory of the church and they were the conquering of the Roman Empire the spiritual the moral and spiritual conquering of the great Roman Empire and it was done without swords all right so the the horseman here is uh, the horseman on the second horse the red horse is the devil red the color of blood obviously uh, the bloody persecutions the, mu the mutual killing they will in order that they kill one another and that we're going to see today we're going to see more of it than there already is today Matthew 10 21 the brother also should deliver up the brother to death and the father and the son and the children shall rise up against their parents and shall put them to death and you shall be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he that shall persevere unto the end, he shall be saved. Matthew 10, 21, the mutual killing. The big sword, and it was given him a great sword. The great sword was the secular power of the Roman Empire. In fact, obviously, the, the whole might of the Roman Empire was turned upon the Christians, starting with Nero. And they were just, humanly speaking, they were just crushed and smashed and crushed and smashed. But they, the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. Who said? Anybody know? Tertullian, surely, yes, that's right. Tertullian, yeah. Tertullian. Brilliant mind, and then went AY. Went, died a heretic. In what heresy? Montanism. Um... So, the big sword on the red horse is the secular power of the Roman Empire being used to slash the Christians to pieces. Um, however, the blood of the martyrs was merely the seed of the church. That was the effect of the, all of those persecutions of blood. And so, for the third horseman, the devil changed tactics. We come into the third persecution the third the third horse was colored yellow when he had opened the third seal I heard a third animal saying come and see and behold a black horse I'm sorry I thought it said it was yellow no it's black look at that. black and he that sat upon him that's the fourth horse which is colored uh, he that sat upon him had a this is the fourth horse. He that sat upon him had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard as it were a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a penny, and thrice two pounds of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the wine and the oil. <clears throat> what on earth does that mean? <laughs> 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 well might you ask. Uh, the black horse is heresy. Remember, the third age is the age of the doctors because after the end of the bloody persecutions in about 315, then you have 315 to 500, the third age of the church, which is an age of the doctors because that was also the age of also all the heresies. The devil changed tactics from persecution by blood to persecution by heresy. So you had the... Um, they all, so many of the church's great doctors come from that time. Therefore, the black horse is heresy, blocking out all light and grace. Black. Blocking out all light and grace. And he that sat upon him had a pair of scales in his hand. This is the heretic. The scales represent the heretic, weighing and judging all things on his own. Weighing and judging all things from self, deciding deciding for himself what he will and won't believe. The horseman is perhaps the heretic. In any case, he is weighing things on his own with a pair of scales. Instead of following tradition and the fathers, instead of docilely following tradition, he's got to work it all out for himself. Verse 6, And I heard a voice... I heard, as it were, a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, Two pounds of wheat for a penny, thrice two pounds of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the wine and the oil. 
Amidst the animals, it's Mother Church. We're back to Mother Church, the vision on the throne. The, the throne was actually on which God sat. The throne is the church, you may remember. But the, amidst the animals, then Mother Church. Amidst the animals, amidst the Gospels. Leaning on the Gospels. Mother Church amidst the Gospels, amidst the four animals. Mother Church reassures the faithful. For a penny, you can get two pounds a week for a penny. You've got to agree that's a bargain. Well, that's the point. The penny is simple faith. Simple faith. Trusting faith. And for simple faith, you will get two pounds, the literal and the mystic sense, of the perfect wheat of the New Testament. So the wheat here is the New Testament. and thrice two pounds of barley for a penny. Barley is the Old Testament, the rough barley of the Old Testament. Thrice two pounds is the literal and mystic sense of the law, the history, and the prophets, which is the division of the Old Testament. The books of law, the books of history, the books of the prophets. That's the three-part division of the Old Testament. So thrice two pounds of rough barley is the literal and mystic sense of the law, history, and prophets of the Old Testament. And see thou hurt not the wine and the oil. Um, the devil is not going to be able, the devil is not to corrupt the force and the sweetness of scripture. So, Mother Church is going to protect, obviously, all instruments of the devil will work with the heretics and they will corrupt scripture as best they can, but Mother Church will protect the wine and the oil of scripture, the sweetness and the strength of scripture. Mother Church will protect the true meaning of scripture which the heretics will do everything to falsify. So provided the uh, people keep their simple faith, they will always be able to draw upon scripture for the true word of God and the true mind of the church, and this will protect them against the heretics. Part of a major part of modernism was the corruption of scripture by the modern exegete, by the rationalist exegetes, the the uh, scripture scholars who have a rational and scientific explanation for everything in scripture, who deny the miracles and deny God. So, also of course, liturgy played a large part in, especially neo-modernism, but also in modernism, not such a part in modernism, but the, the falsification of the liturgy has played a huge part in neo-modernism. The falsification of scripture in both. So, after the heretics, the fourth persecution is by the hypocrites or false brethren. That sort of corresponds to the fourth age of the church, but not so exactly. One, two, three correspond exactly to the three ages of the church. Fourth, fourth seal doesn't quite so correspond to the fourth age, nor does the fifth or sixth seal. Or the seventh. So, one, two, three seals correspond to one of the three ages of the church, the first three letters to the seven churches, but from four, five, six, seven, you, lo you lose it. There's no correspondence. So the fourth persecution is the fourth horse. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. And behold, a pale horse, and he that sat upon him, his name was Death, and hell followed him. 
And power is given to him over the four parts of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. The fourth horseman of the apocalypse, death. This horse is pale. Verse 8. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice, the voice of the fourth animal saying, Come and see. And behold, a pale horse. Pale in appearance, meaning white, uh, appearing white or stainless, but not white or stainless in fact. In other words, off-white. Say that pale is off-white. Not the purity of the Christians, which is white. It's an imitation of the purity of the Christians, or off-white. It's hypocrisy. White in appearance, but not in fact. In other words, looking Christian, but not in reality. The horseman is the devil. The horseman on the, fourth ha on the fourth horse is the devil, the father of eternal death. Hell follows because the devil causes disorder and suffering, obviously. In the wake of the devil comes all kinds of chaos. A heresy is the beginning and then it comes out at uh, it comes out at civil war and blood and murder, like Luther, Luther, and then the peasants' revolt a few years later. So um, it's not here that he starts that. So, but hell follows. Hell follows. I say the end of the, the end. The conclusion of the devil is is all kinds of chaos breaking out, murder and everything. But uh, if that's the conclusion, where's his start? The devil always starts with heresy. Stop and think about it. Um, maybe with sensuality also, in order to corrupt people and get them ready for heresy. Sensuality will often go with heresy, because sensuality always has a pull. But, but, uh, just like with Adam, it's always true. With, uh, it's always true. A man's mind must begin to waver before his sensuality will cut loose. Uh, there's got to be something wrong with the, there's probably something wrong with the prayer life before a man gets into real sensual trouble. Uh, the higher soul will be in trouble before the lower soul will. It won't usually start with sensuality, it will start with the neglect of prayer. Uh, and then it becomes sensuality. He becomes interested in women when he stops being interested, so, inter so interested in God, I, I speak, in, in simple terms. Uh, but if a man sustains and maintains his interest in the Lord God and is, keeps oriented directed towards the Lord God, the women and the sensuality in those temptations are not going to so, nearly so easily catch him. So um, that's where it starts with heresy. It start, does start with heresy. And then immediately backing up heresy will be sensuality with its various, the flesh. But it will start in the top of the mind with heresy. So... Um, the hell follows because the devil causes disorder and suffering. The four parts of mankind are Christians, Jews, pagans, and heretics. The four parts of mankind, power is given to him over the four parts of the earth. The four parts of mankind of the earth are Jews, pagans, heretics. Four different categories. Not reducible. None of those categories are reducible to any of the others. Uh, the sword is perfidious suggestions. Power is going to go the force that's kill with the sword, perfidious suggestions, with famine, the suppression of, of the sacraments and of the word of God. We feed as Christians feed off the Eucharist and off Scripture. So famine is privation of the Eucharist and privation of Scripture. Of course, you've got that with the novice order. Privation of the Eucharist because obviously the, new, the Mass has been destroyed. Privation of scripture because of the false interpretation, humanistic interpretation of scripture. So uh, famine is the suppression of the sacraments and of the word of God. Death is cutting off from the church, being cut off from the church. Power is given them over the four parts of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine, with death. And the death is cutting off from the church. Wild beasts are the unleashing of devastating passions like wild beasts. Behold, when he opened the uh, fifth seal, I saw beneath the altar the souls of those killed because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had. 
are beneath the altar, in other words, closely united to the sacrifice of the Savior. Closely united to the Savior's sacrifice. These are the saints, the, the, the martyrs in the altar crying out. Closely united to the Savior's sacrifice. And they cried out with a great voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge, and dost thou not avenge our blood upon those who dwell in the earth? They cry out of a great desire for the coming of God's kingdom. The saints want God's kingdom to come. The martyrs in the altar cry out for God's kingdom to come. Why don't you, Lord, why don't you get on with it? It's, for people, it's very tempting to say the same thing today. What are you waiting for, Lord? Do you still need to know they're bad guys? Why are you not, why don't you get in there and show them? Uh, Eleven, and there was given to each one of them a white alb, or, or sorry, a white stove. And it was said to them that they should keep quiet until, for a little time, yet, that they should rest for a little time, that they should hang in there for a little time yet, requiescent, until their fellow servants should be filled up, and their brothers, who are due to be killed just like them. In other words, the Lord God is waiting, is hanging back, because the list of martyrs is not yet filled up. And that's true today. That's undoubtedly true today. Then, the white robes are essential beatitude, namely of soul without body. To each of these single saints that's already martyred and is a saint and is in heaven safely associated with our Lord, crying out beneath the altar, each of those is given a white, uh, what did I say, white robes. Of course, Albus... Yeah, you know, well, Alba is the white stolid. They were each, each, each of them given white robes. And that white robe is essential beatitude. Namely, the beatitude of the soul without the body. The body will always waiting for the general judgment, of course. But they are already, the, the souls that are in heaven are in heaven. The souls of the just that have died before the general judgment are in heaven. A little while... From now until Judgment Day is no time when compared with eternity. So hang in there a little while until the number of their fellow servants. The fellow servants are confessors and their brothers are fellow martyrs. That's the fifth seal. So that's a glimpse of consolation amidst... Uh, all of the trials and tribulations of the church from war, heresy, hypocrisy, a glimpse of consolation. Then the sixth seal is the triumph of the Antichrist. I saw when he had opened the sixth, earthquake, uh, the sixth seal and behold a great earthquake happened uh, the earthquake is the general upheaval preceding the Antichrist. Today we're living through, you've heard me say many, many times, the dress rehearsal of that upheaval, which quite, res as the dress rehearsal resembles the final performance, so the end of the fifth age of the church quite resembles the seventh age, which is what makes a number of people think we're going, we're living today through the days of the Antichrist. I don't think so, right? Earthquake, the general upheaval preceding the Antichrist. The sun is Christ. The sun was made black like sackcloth. Christ, outraged, will seem to have withdrawn. The sun turned black, the sun darkness. The sun is Christ and Christ will seem to have withdrawn, much like today. Christ almost seems to have withdrawn. He, he's just no longer there. He's pulled out, in a manner of speaking. Christ, outraged, will have seemed to withdraw. The moon is the church. The moon is totally reduced to blood. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the whole moon became as blood. The moon is the church which will be reduced, which will be reddened, turned red by the bloodiest of persecutions. 
the end of the world. The, the church, the moon has gone the color of blood. Uh, the church will be reddened by the bloodiest of persecutions. The stars, or we know who they are, the, the stars falling from the sky are the bishops apostatizing. Prelates will apostatize in large numbers. Bishops, prelates, leaders of the church. Prelates is a broad word. Every bishop is a prelate, but not every prelate, prelate is a bishop. Prelate will include cardinals, nuncios, all of the high up officials in the church. Prelates will apostatize in large numbers. So the stars are prelates, which includes, which is mostly bishops. They will fall away from the faith in large numbers, verse 13. And the stars of the heaven fell down upon the earth like, like the fig tree, shaking its big its figs when uh, in a high wind. The high wind, obviously, is the apostas, general apostasy and the bishops are shaken and fallen off. And 14, uh, the heaven departed as a book folded up and every mountain and the islands were moved out of their places. The heavens, uh, heaven is scripture. Scripture will become like a closed book, uh, like a papyrus just being rolled up. The whole of the heavens were rolled up. Uh, like today we would roll up the carpet in the sanctuary. It's just rolled up. Heaven, uh, heaven is rolled up like a book. Uh, also, scripture will become like a closed book and the church's liturgy will be silenced. So the church's liturgy is also heaven. Heaven is being folded up. Well, you can see that's happened obviously to a huge extent the last 20, 30 years. The, the liturgy being folded up and scripture being folded up. Nobody can make any sense of scripture any longer because they've got all these crazy modern ideas. The liturgy, don't speak of it. And that both of them are heaven in each in its way, where God is king. And the kings of the earth and prin princes and tribunes, tribunes is a Roman, uh, fifth, verse 15. And they were sort of... Um, Officers of the people, uh, to defend the people. This was the bureau, if you like, this was sort of the bureaucracy, and then this was the, they were the officers of the people. Kind of, I'm not an expert, but sort of to defend the people against the bureaucracy. That's why he says, uh, princes, kings, princes, and tribunes. The, the <laughs> tribunes are not sort of in the hierarchy, they're not in the monarchy, they're slight, they're more officers of the people. All right. They were all of them, uh, and the rich, and the strong, and every servant, and free man. They were hiding, they hid themselves in caves, and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains of the rocks, fall upon us, and hide us from the face of he who sits upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day has, uh, of uh, anger has come, and who shall be able to stand? Uh, verse 16. Obviously, Luke 23, verse 30, the way of the cross. Uh, the day will come when you weep for yourselves, daughters of Jerusalem. The day is going to come when you will say, the mountains come and fall upon us. Luke 23, verse 30. Job 26, verse 12. Hell is naked before him, there is no covering for destruction. He stretched out the north over the empty space and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He bindeth up the waters in his clouds so that they break not out and fall not to get down together. He withholdeth the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud over it. He hath set bounds upon the waters till light and darkness come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and dread at his beck. By his power the seas are suddenly gathered together and his wisdom has struck the proud one. His spirit hath adorned the heavens and his obstetric hand brought forth the winding serpent. So this is Job speaking about the Lord God. But <laughs> and they will say, fall upon us. And uh, Verse 17, the great day of wrath, Deezere, Deezere, Joel 2, verse 11. <coughs> Joel 2, verse 11. And the Lord hath uttered his voice for before the face of his army, for his armies are exceeding great, for they are strong and execute his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can stand it? The prophet foretells the terrible day of the Lord. Blow ye the trumpet in Sion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, because the day of the Lord cometh, because it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and whirlwinds, 
and numerous and strong people as the morning spread upon the mountains. The life to it hath not been seen from the beginning, nor shall it be even to the years of generation and generation. Before the face thereof a devouring fire, and behind it a burning flame. The land is like a garden of pleasure before it, and behind it a desolate wilderness. Neither is there anyone that can escape it. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and they shall run like horsemen. They shall leap like the noise of chariots upon the tops of mountains, like the noise of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, as a strong people prepared to battle. At their presence the people shall be in grievous pains, all faces shall be made like a kettle. They shall run like valiant men, like men of war they shall scale the wall. The men shall march everyone on his way, and they shall not turn aside from their ranks. No one shall press upon his brother, they shall walk everyone in his path, yea, and they shall fall through the windows and shall take no harm. They shall enter into the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up the houses, they shall come in at the windows as a thief. At their presence the earth hath trembled, the heavens are moved, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars have withdrawn their shining. Familiar? And the Lord hath uttered his voice before the face of his army, for his armies are exceeding great, for they are strong, and execute his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can stand it? Now therefore saith the Lord, be converted to me with all your heart in fasting, and in weeping, and in mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, patient and rich in mercy, and ready to repent of the evil. The prophet Joel is obviously warning the Israelites in language that could easily apply to the capture of Jerusalem by the Assyrians and the Chaldeans in uh, the late 600s and early 500 BC, the capture of Jerusalem. Joel lived a little before the capture of Jerusalem. But it obviously applies also, can apply also to the end of the world. It can apply to any time when the people of God are being, have enemies closing in on them and destroying them. And the people need to convert. It's always the same, the same truth. 